Okay, we, um, we're going to um, proceed with Rule 10. We've been uh, working on Rule 10 for a while. Like I say, this is a pretty extensive rule. And so uh, uh, we're going to continue with this till we get it done, then we'll move on to Rule 11. But uh, in the meantime, there's a lot of meat and good material in Rule 10. And um, let me just read it over one more time. As the waters bathe the foam created, they are absorbed and used. The form increases in its strength. Let the magician thus continue until the work suffices. Let the outer builders cease their labors then and let the inner workers enter in on their cycle. Now in the last week we were talking about uh, new forms and predictions that he made about the coming era. There's just one thing uh, we need to cover just a hair more. He predicted within a generation or so a new approach and different fundamental concept as to the nature of matter will mark the new age. And we talked about one of one of his uh, predictions talking about uh, uh, how the soul actually creates form will be discovered and we figured that must be uh, the the uh, discovery of DNA was the discovery of how that happens because the soul works through DNA and through DNA the form is is uh, manipulated and created but he makes a prediction another prediction here that a new approach and a different fundamental concept as to the nature of uh, matter will mark the new age. Um, what uh, scientific investigations was that? Did have we done that uh, illustrate that? Can you think of what that prediction may have been about? Remember this prediction back in uh, 1934. What, what was the prediction exactly again? says a new approach and different a different fundamental concept as to the nature of matter will mark the new age. Uh, that makes me think of quantum mechanics. Good, good, uh, very good. That's exactly right. In other words, quantum mechanics, as we were, science is examining that, uh, they found uh, the old approach to matter, which is black and white, doesn't really work. Uh, they found that uh, that when matter has consciousness applied to it, it has a different aspect to it than when consciousness is not there, and that's a makes a totally new um, uh, way of looking at matter. And scientists are forced to look at it this way because that's what happens. <laughs> they can't deny that it happens, and. Uh, like uh, it was interesting when they discovered quantum entanglement, which when uh, uh, one photon spins one way, another photon, uh, uh, a photon that is paired with it, even though it's separated by uh, millions of miles, will spin the opposite way as if they're in connection faster than the speed of light. And Einstein himself, he says, this is, spooky reaction at a distance he says uh, he, he he just couldn't hardly accept it because it was so strange he called it spooky and same thing with the double slit experiment where which showed that if we look at uh, a photon passing through, if we look at just a single photon passing through a double slit to see which slit it goes through then it has the uh, 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 effect of being a particle. But if we don't look, then it uh, produces a reaction on the other side of the double slit like it's a wave. And so uh, just lo looking at it consciously changes uh, the matter aspect. And by extension, this, this could mean that uh, when you're looking at the world out there, it exists, and if you're not looking at it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> That's kind of the extension you get from this. And I don't think it's that way, actually. What I think it is, is the blueprint for everything that exists 
always is there. But when consciousness pays attention, it produces uh, uh, a reality force. And I, th I think it works something like that, but it's very mysterious, this, uh, the quantum, uh, quantum world, and, and science is still baffled by it. They do not understand why it works the way that it is, and they've been working on it for uh, quite a while now, and they're completely baffled. It's okay. almost like that, that revelation is totally separate from everything else. Like that, that understanding of the reality doesn't bleed over into society at all. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's w weird, but uh, uh, the now the Tibetan says the physical world about us is really created on an illusionary principle. Now, this kind of goes along with quantum mechanics. If that's if what the Tibetan says is true, it coincides with quantum mechanics, which tells us that. If you're not looking at matter, then it's not really matter as we think that it is. And that's basically what DK has been writing about since uh, 1920 and telling us that. So uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, he says this. This is, uh, this is one of the keys when, when the uh, um, uh, high initiate uh, reaches a certain point in consciousness, this, this might be one of the keys as to why he can control matter and uh, uh, say, even teleport himself perhaps. Who knows? We'll learn more as we go along. I think it's some, yeah. it has something to do with the Hindu uh, understanding of non-duality uh, where the consciousness uh, creates our reality. Yeah, our consciousness it's creates our reality. <laughs> yeah, what's interesting about this, uh, say um, you've got the TV playing downstairs, but you're not paying attention to it. You know, it's it's still passed through time, and it's still there when you go down, even though you have, <laughs> haven't looked at it. And same thing with whatever's happening in China is happening now. but And it is happening. But it's happening perhaps in a way, a little bit different way than we think that it's happening. It's happening on a different level than we think that it's happening. This is perhaps the message of quantum uh, mechanics. Just like the particle passing through the double slit. If you look at it, it leaves uh, uh, an impact on the other side of the double slit like it's a bullet. If you don't look at it, it leaves an impact on the other side like it's a wave. And uh, so it's kind of weird. But what's interesting is very consistent. If, you, if consciousness looks at it, then uh, it always is a particle. So it doesn't, it doesn't make up its mind to be a particle one time and a wave another time, but it's affected by your direct consciousness, which is very strange. But uh, just verifies what DK says, that uh, the physical world that we see about us is not a principle, and it's created by an, uh, some principle of illusion, he tells us, which is pretty uh, interesting. And I've always wondered about that. Okay, any other comments or questions on that before we move on? Kind of interesting subject. Yeah, I found out that uh, if you spend too much time just being in the here and now, uh, you kind of lose your temporal sense of balance. It's like, oh, it's if I'm retired, then it's always Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. Okay, any other th anything else? Okay, he talks about the trends that are coming. He says a positive trend is that people are becoming more group conscious and more concerned about the welfare of others outside of themselves and their families. Many organizations are assisting others. So this is one thing that uh, is different about the time that we're in compared to centuries ago. 
is that people are becoming more conscious, more sensitive about uh, uh, other people. Uh, more benevolent organiz organizations are starting up, uh, more charities. <clears throat> Despite the fact that we always have our share of problems going on in the world, we overlook the fact that there's good things that are happening and we're, we actually are making progress as a society. He says, philosophy will change emphasis from God and his relation to man, spiritual relationships, the end of days to dealing with love, wisdom aspect. There will be a new beginning in understanding wisdom, which has been sadly lacking. So instead of the old time religion, we're going to drift more toward things that are reasonable and have wisdom applied to them. And he says, eventually, we will even understand the workings and the minds of the planetary logos himself. And the, time, the divine aspect of soul will become more and more widely recognized. Now, remember, this was written in the 1930s. Do you think uh, the idea that uh, of a soul and a higher self is more prevalent now than it was 80 years ago? What do you guys think? How far have we come since 1934? A lot more books have been written on the light <laughs> of the soul and yeah. aspects of the soul and consciousness of the of the soul. Yeah, and a lot of research has been done. A lot of research has been done with hypnosis, taking people back in between lives and uh, finding out that uh, uh, about the the soul life that we have in between. And uh, that's uh, giving a lot of evidence that uh, there is a spirit world and a higher self. Okay. It seems like there's, there's a lot more information being, being put out and uh, people are being more aware and the people are waking up and uh, you're seeing that everywhere you turn around, they're talking about esoteric things or spiritual things or ghost things or the psychic energy. You know, uh, it's getting... Uh, put out more and more and more and people are becoming more and more aware of it, which has given us uh, us people who are, are, are trying to uh, lead a path, uh, giving them a way to look at things uh, and giving them options that, that weren't available, uh, you know, options mentally that weren't available 20 years ago. Uh, we're seeing a whole movement happening. Right. Uh, he says uh, we're going to go from just uh, the soul as being like a, a theory to the fact that it will be eventually seen by the majority of people as a fact. And he says the time will come when science of the soul will actually be taught in our universities. So that would be interesting. You know, starting to, give, starting to give yoga classes and a few things like that there now, but uh, I guess the next step is to give classes about the soul eventually. Yeah, it seems somebody. to me there's a lot more um, atheism uh, going on. That there there's been a lot of falling away in, in the belief in God or the soul and that kind of thing. But there's yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point too. It seems, seems like one side, uh, the more materialistic side has become more materialistic and less believing. And then, uh, the other part of humanity is becoming, um, more investigative toward, uh, the spiritual realms. Well, I think there's been like, uh, I guess Stacy was was talking about. There's been more of a a deeper knowledge or connection with the soul in in some people than there was years back. But what what's missing is that widespread sort of religious belief in God or the soul. I think that that's fallen away and it hasn't been replaced by you know direct experience or anything. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think there's I a, think, lot, uh, a lot yeah, more questioning going on by like the younger generation that's they're not really buying into the old school of religious thought uh, about Jesus and the old, the old salvation and they're thinking more along the lines of creating artificial intelligence and the roles that they're going to play on more of a lot plane and I think they're they're letting go of all the old there's a there yeah. Yeah, there's kind of a shift, uh, a new understanding of energies and frequencies and stuff where 
uh, we're taking the old, uh, what, what we learn uh, the old, from the old ways and bringing that forward and leaving the rest of the stuff behind that uh, is no longer applies to us in this day and age. And, and the people are looking for a new outlet of, of where's this spiritual connection and what they're, uh, they, they have to, what they're starting to understand is there's a, a new dawning of uh, understanding is that this, it applies to energies and these uh, frequencies that uh, we vibrate out of us and understanding of cause and effects. And so they're yeah. getting a, a new grasp on it. Uh, and what's coming out of the East is helping us. Uh, it, it's bringing a lot of this understanding together of religions and uh, cause and effects. And, yeah, there's and people a, there's, can't, can no longer just religion. Yeah, there's a part of society that Go is, ahead, that is uh, moving toward more light and truth. And there's a part that's, like you say, they're not believing like they did, but they're not believing because a lot of them, like, say, like Curtis says, are just questioning. And they're not believing just because their parents told them that, hey, you got to believe in this faith. They're, uh, they, they want some evidence as to why the supernatural is true. But uh, so we have these two camps here. One, one camp is, uh, is going closer to the truth. It's a little bit like, uh, like uh, health. When I first started getting interested in uh, uh, healthy type uh, living and products and things like that, I thought, well, when I first got interested was back in the late 60s. And I thought, boy, you know, in another 30, 40 years, probably everybody will be interested in in eating healthy and, and nutrition. And what's interesting is as we've evolved, that hasn't quite happened that way. People are more interested in like uh, healthy products, organic foods, uh, things like that. They're selling more. But on the other hand, we also have a lot more people just eating really bad stuff. <laughs> so uh, we've had the two extremes evolving. People are uh, coming closer to the truth with, say, health products as well as spiritual products. And then another segment of the population just kind of uh, not paying much attention, uh, winding, winding up being worse than ever. But uh, so it's kind of interesting how that's working out. Okay, any other comments before we move ahead here? Well, I was going to say that you've talked about uh, uh, more atheism, let's say. Um, it's been my observation that even though there are, seems to be, I mean, when I look at people that are, let's say, leaving the Mormon church, a lot of them become atheists, not all of them, but, um, but then a lot of them too are, are, are very examining, very um, analytical of now of, of different teachings and, and they're looking for evidence of things like of God and they're not. Yeah, they're still looking, right. It's yeah. like some of the most intelligent people are, have been called atheists, like some people who called Einstein an atheist. But he wasn't an atheist. He just didn't re accept the God on the throne type of thing, looking in our bedrooms and examining all of our thoughts every night. And uh, I've, I've been uh, noticing some of the atheists I've been that, in. That's what some of these intelligent minds have rejected, not, not the fact that there's a higher power. Yeah, right. go ahead. And so, and so, a lot of a lot of the atheists that I've seen are, are, are like they call themselves humanist atheists, where they're they're very much involved and concerned with the 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 state of mankind, and and are very uh, much reaching out to helping other people. They they may not believe in a god per se, but they do believe in helping people, and yeah. so that's yeah. that I think very much commendable there. Yeah. Yeah. Mankind is making, humankind is making progress, slow but sure. Now he gives uh, several words of warning here to disciples. He says, first, here he says, hold not to the form, no matter what it may be. All forms are but experiments. And reach the point where they are in balance to be either discarded or verified, vivified. Okay. 
That's, he makes an interesting statement. All forms are experiments. So you look at the flowers out there, or your dog or whatever. <laughs> it's an experiment by higher uh, intelligence to, uh, to carry on the uh, uh, evolution of uh, life here upon the earth. It's a kind of an interesting way to word it. He says, there is an ebb and flow of personality energies, and when high, they can distract from the soul. Okay, personality energies, remember, is energy of your vital body, or which be like controls your health, your emotional self, and your mental self. And he says, when these energies are really high in circulation, they can distract from the soul, because you kind of got to quiet all these things down to, to contact the soul. Three says, with the individual and groups, there come periods wherein the vision is obscured and all seems bleak, but the light always breaks through. Okay, anyone identify with that? Come periods where you seem to not have any contact and then other times where you feel impressions starting to come through, cycles like that I, I like bet you yeah like going, going through dark nights of the soul so to speak where you just kind of feel lost and uh, you feel alone and uh, you start uh, getting some things from the hierarchies helping you right the dark night would be maybe a longer cycle then you have shorter cycles maybe um, like for instance with me I write a thought every day sometimes I come and sit down at the computer and I think, well, what kind of thought am I going to come up with? And I do not feel inspired at all. <laughs> and so I got to quiet down my personality energies to try to come up with what I think is an inspiring thought. But oftentimes I'll sit down at the computer when it's time for me to create my thought for the day. And I just do not feel inspired at all. <laughs> you know, And I think, I think, uh, I don't know if uh, I can do this, but if I quiet myself down and focus on the soul, well, uh, something eventually uh, uh, comes. So uh, this is what we have to do, and we have to realize that sometimes there'll, there's, there's periods just in the day, maybe during the 24 hours, you feel a lot more connected than other times, or maybe you drop a iron on your toe or something like that that just totally interferes with your soul connection for a while but uh, uh, whatever so uh, he says do not permit yourselves to to get discouraged discouragement is due to three causes one low physical vitality which increases negative astral force so it's important we keep our physical vitality up, uh, eat well, get some exercise, sunshine, take extra vitamins, uh, um, do what you can to keep your, your vital body in good shape. Because if you're, if you're not feeling good, it's really hard to be, you know, really cheerful and, and positive all the time. So, uh, uh, I got to give credit to Lorraine. She's been through a lot the past few years, but she continues to be positive whenever you talk to her. And, and uh, Alice A. Bailey, the last ten year, nine or ten years of her life, she was in very, very poor physical condition. It took an extreme effort on her part to complete her work because uh, she had. Uh, uh, and really uh, uh, bad anemia, and uh, she had that blood transfusion just to survive the last few years. And so uh, it's important that we keep her vital body up as much as possible, but if we have problems, it's important that we continue to focus and work on uh, anyway. That's sort of the plus side of it being so cold is that I've spent a lot more time hibernating under a pile of blankets. <laughs> <laughs> don't you have a heater there, Rick? Just a couple little space heaters, and they really don't do the job. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's too bad. Well, but I'm, I, It's too many years in Florida. 
<laughs> I've got way too long. I'll get used to it. Well, the worst of the winter's over there. Hopefully. Good thing you're not in Alaska in that place you're in now. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Feels like it some days. Okay. He says, um, the second cause of discouragement, he says, is the overdevelopment of the concrete mind, overtaxing the emotional and physical self. It sees too many problems and solutions, sense too, senses too much responsibility. It says the balance, the solution for this is uh, to realize that all does not depend on you. The world will move forward with or without you. So the overdevelopment of the concrete mind means it's, it's a lot of people have feel the whole weight of the world upon their shoulders or they've just got too many thoughts running through their minds. They're reviewing too many uh, problems. <clears throat> they say the main difference between us and an animal, the advantage that the animal has over us, like the dog, is he doesn't think about the past or the future. Your dog just thinks about what's happening right now. He wants to be fed right now, and that's all he's thinking about. With us, we think of the past and the future and all the problems that could happen. And this, we, if we overthink everything, uh, we get discouraged. But you ever notice your dog never gets discouraged in seeking for food from you <laughs> or seeking what he wants? <clears throat> he never gets discouraged because he's, he doesn't have the, this, the, all these things going through his mind the way that a human does. It's too strong of a, a third thing that produces discouragement is too strong of a reaction when evil or darkness manifests. The solution is a nonviolent reaction, but the use of reason and poise and understanding that in time will be, bring correction. One must link up with the soul, soul group, and then the master. So he says, apparently, uh, we all, if a person is a disciple, he contacts, has some contact with negative energy, he may not have direct contact with a dark brother, but uh, he's, he has to face his dweller periodically, and uh, the negative forces will arise. And uh, he says, people have too strong of a reaction, they fear too much. Uh, the person must use reason, understanding, and link up with his soul. His soul will help you diffuse that. And then beyond your soul is your group soul. You have a group soul. There's a certain number that you're closely connected to on the other side. That uh, once you tune up with your soul, you can also tune up with them and, and bring down extra energy. And then the final energy can come from a master that you may be linked up to and you can get additional help from them to overcome the uh, negativity. He says, an important thing a disciple must learn, he says, is to move forward even when there are no noticeable results. And this is what really discourages a lot of people is they encounter um, a plan or uh, get a piece of the plan in their mind and they go forward and they don't change the world within a short period of time so they give up and they just uh, uh, quit trying to do anything to create positive change but once the disciple catches a piece of the plan that he's supposed to participate in it's important that he goes forward even though there are no noticeable results. Like we're trying to create a molecule and it's a slow process and some people have become discouraged and not participating with us that were at one time interested but we didn't get quick noticeable results so they're not here. And so uh, uh, you who are staying here uh, with me, uh, uh, it's important that uh, we realize this principle that uh, once we catch a glimpse of the purpose we're supposed to be involved in, we must go forward 
even if there's no noticeable results, because eventually there will be noticeable results. But it's not, the results don't always happen on cue or when we expect them. But they, they will come, but uh, it's like putting sugar in a glass of water, you put a little bit in, you don't notice anything. And then once you hit the saturation point, you can see the sugar begin to distill. And so it's the same way with, with us proceeding. He says there are five things which those who choose a path of occultism need to cultivate. And that is the group should sp specifically seek to attain. They are as follows. Number one, a person should attain a consecration of motive. What do you think he means by that? A consecration of motive. In other words, the disciple needs to uh, um, dedicate, figure out what his motive is, a motive to say, be a servant for humanity, a motive to create positive change, and then dedicate himself to making that happening and to be an agent. Second is a difficult one, and that's utter fearlessness. And he doesn't say fearless, just fearlessness. <laughs> he says, utter fearlessness okay so the disciple can't be afraid of dark brothers or negative forces or the irs or or uh, uh the next door neighbor or the ex-wife or whatever you know he just has to go forward without as if there's nothing to fear and that's easier said than done if you look at uh, most people's lives there's something in their consciousness that that they, uh, uh, that may be distracting them from moving ahead because of certain fears, could be financial, health. It's all kinds of things for us to worry about. But the disciple must seek to cultivate utter fearlessness. I like that word, utter fearlessness. Third thing he says, he must have the cultivation of the imagination balanced wisely by the reasoning faculty. Okay, now Rick keeps telling me he's not really big on visualization, but he got a heck of imagination. So this might be where you kind of shine, Rick. Uh, you got a pretty good imagination, don't you? I do. I, my Basically, my life's profession has been uh, one who converts thoughts into things. And I do that with my visualiz visualization and imagination. It's like, uh, if you can think it, I could probably build it. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the let yourself imagine things. I remember when I was a kid, I noticed that uh, the adults seem to lose their power of imagining things. And I'd go around, I'd play cowboys and Indians, and I'd imagine those Indians over there, and I'd shoot them and stuff. <laughs> or I'd shoot the bad guys. And it was like they were real to me, you know. And I thought, you know, adults don't have imagination like us kids. Us kids can imagine stuff just like it's really here. And... I'm looking forward to being an adult, except for this one thing, is I don't want to lose this imagination that I got, you know, that adults don't seem to have anymore when they grow up. And uh, so uh, uh, what I've tried to do is I've tried to keep that aspect. I kind of made a commitment when I was a kid to not, not lose how, how it felt to have imagination like that. And I, I think back to that time quite often when I was a little kid, how how I valued that and I didn't want to lose it. And uh, so it's important that we keep that. And it's something I think we're just born with because little kids are, when you play with them, you know, when I play with the grandkids, it kind of brings back how it felt to be a kid and you can use your imagination and play with them and pretend things are happening and they just really catch on they can just see those animals you're imagining or whatever and i'm still a little kid i play on the floor with them <laughs> yeah i think little kids are given to us to uh 
uh, keep us young and uh, keep that imagination going. But anyway, with with disciples, it's important that we uh, we keep that ability to imagine. Okay, the fourth thing he says a disciple must keep is a capacity to weigh evidence wisely and accept only that which is compatible with the highest instinct and intuition. Okay, this is something that a lot of people do um, lack, especially in the, the religions of the world. You ask them about their beliefs and they, uh, they just don't uh, uh, weigh the evidence. Uh, my uh, brother-in-law, who Curtis knows, he, Curtis, my nephew, uh, was a nuclear physicist. And he was very logical when we were talking about nuclear physics or science, very logical guy. But then we start talking about religion and all of a sudden the devil was responsible for everything going on. <laughs> the logic just flew out the window. Right, Curtis knows him too, we we're all related. And uh, yeah, once you start talking about religion, just, yeah, logic just went out right out the window, right Curtis? Yeah. Yeah, he was just, uh, <laughs> it was just amazing. We went from, we could be talking about science, total logic, and then move to religion and just no logic, no logic anymore at all. Just uh, outside forces was control of everything. Okay, the fifth thing the disciple needs here, he tells us to develop, is a willingness to experiment. And uh, this is something people in the regular religions just don't get much of. They're told to conform in the regular religions and not only the religions, but the new age movements too. Uh, if you're under some guru or whatever, the, uh, every, all these uh, people are seeking for their followers to conform. And people need to be free to do some experiments, like Rick's always doing some weird stuff that I don't know what he's doing, and that's fine, but he's experimenting at least. So he's he's uh, discovering things for himself, and if he discovers something really good, he can share it with us. And this is what we all should do is experiment and uh, uh, say, uh, uh, Ken might read a totally different book than I've ever read, and it may, talk about certain things you can do in meditation that maybe I haven't thought of. And he's experimenting with it and he might discover things that nobody in the group has thought of, then he can share it with us. But um, a willingness to experiment, that's sadly lacking in, in uh, standard uh, religion and spiritual formats and it should be emphasized. Because he says the whole creation really is an experiment. He says every form that we see about us was part of an ex experiment to, uh, uh, you know, see how it conforms, see how it works, see how we, it can be put to use by intelligence. This whole planet is part of a great uh, 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 experiment to see what, can be done with it to further intelligence and move us along the path. I think the entire universe is, uh, is the result of a question of, I wonder what would happen if. Right, that's exactly right. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it all comes down to experience. I mean, the, if what makes life worthwhile is the experience you're going through, whatever that is. And so we want to improve the quality of the experience. And once, once we reach a certain level and learn everything from it, then we want to move ahead and have a different experience. He says, these five tendencies, coupled with purity of life and regulation of thought, will lead to the sphere of achievement. So those things are pretty important. He says, these five things will lead us to the sphere of achievement. Okay, so keep that in mind. I'll just cover them again very uh, quickly. One, consecration of motive. Two, utter fearlessness, cultivation of the imagination. Four, weighing evidence. And five, experimentation. These five things, he says, will lead 
to the sphere of achievement. He says a disciple will not know all things, but it's important that he, he knows a certain amount of things that are usable for the work. And so uh, it's like we can't do everything. We can put our attention on so much. And uh, if we put our attention on too many things, then we won't be really good at anything. So we can't, none of us will know everything in this particular world. Now, um, if, if we're totally linked to God in these, the spirit type thing, uh, it might be a different matter. But here, where we're under the limitation of the physical body, you're, uh, you're, we're limited in how much we can put our attention on. Now, he talks a little bit more about utter fearlessness. He says, the real problem lies in achieving utter fearlessness. All fear, doubt, and worry have to be eliminated in the disciple. Once fear is overcome, sources of inspiration will increase in a wonderful manner. So that's interesting. You don't usually connect uh, inspiration with fearlessness. But he says, overcoming fear is important. Well, because once fear is overcome, what happens to your state of mind when fear is overcome? It's relaxed and receptive. Right, relaxed, receptive, you can be at peace. But it's difficult to be at peace if you're worrying about something. And uh, Dale Carnegie wrote a really good book about worry. It's called How to Stop Wor Worrying and Start Living, I think, something like that. And he points out in it that uh, almost everything that people worry about never happened. So in other words, they put all that attention and fear and worry and something that didn't happen. So it was energy completely wasted. wasted. <laughs> <laughs> because what they were so concerned about didn't happen at all. And uh, another way to look at it is, well, let's suppose the worst did happen. Uh, how bad would it be? <laughs> and, and uh, well, sometimes things are worse than you expect. That's true. But, uh, but overall, even if the worst happened, you, you, you're going to live through it and you're going to come out okay. Normally. Unless this too shall pass. <laughs> right, right. This too shall pass. Time heals all things, as they say. What are some of the things a disciple fears? Now, the average person, he fears money and health, things like that. So what's, what's some of the fears, say, a person on the path fears? What do you think? Any comment being, on that? Being disconnected from community of any kind. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, Failure to implement the plan. Right, right. Fear of failure, I say they think that maybe the powers that be don't think they're up to the job or things like this. Well, let's suppose that, uh, Joshua, let's suppose you, you're thinking about stuff and you think, well, I'm supposed to do all these wonderful things and I'm just not up to the job. What, what, uh, how, how are you supposed to approach a feeling like that? Um, well, to recognize that you don't know everything and maybe you are able to do more than you understand, or maybe there's unseen factors that will mitigate, uh, your inability. Good point. And one more thing is this, there is always something you can do to make a difference. Think of that. There's always something you can do. You may feel like you're at a dead end, but if you feel like you're at a dead end, think of this thought. There's something I can do to make a difference. What is that? Okay. Ask yourself that question. It may be just giving somebody a compliment or maybe just uh, give some homeless guy five bucks or something. But uh, there's always something you can do to make a difference. So it can be just something real small. So do that one thing. And then your soul will give you something else to make a difference until eventually you can make a, a larger and larger difference.
You know, that's really good, Joe. I had a, I went to my dad's place and came back with 23 boxes of apples. <laughs> I can imagine. And loaded up my truck with them, and I spent the last two months giving them away. I put them in, in bags, about 20 apples in each bag. Yeah, you always give me apples. <laughs> and I, yeah, how do you like them apples? Yeah, good. And, I, and I've given away 20 boxes of wow to about 50 different people. And it's winter time, and I don't have a lot going on. And um, you're right, you can. It doesn't take a lot to make a difference. And I've had a lot of people thank me. Oh, my kids just love apples. I, you know, these and they're really good. And you know, just a little thing, just giving my neighbors some apples, and and now they're friendly and they're he's a Christian and take, take them back to Phoenix and trade them for oranges. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I, I was a kid. Orange is home, actually. I remember when I was a kid <laughs> trick or treating. When somebody gave me an apple and threw it in the bag, I, it used to kind of irritate me because I wanted candy. But now when I look back, I think, boy, you know that apple is a lot more expensive than a piece of candy. That guy uh, was actually pretty nice giving me an apple. When I look back now, except I didn't appreciate it when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, you wanted chocolates, I know. Right, right. He says, fears can be controlled by several things. One, by direct inhibition. It often produces, this often produces a headache, congestion of the liver, and other disorders. So this isn't the best way to do it. In other words, suppression. So if you fear something, just if you just tell yourself, you know, this is no big deal. I shouldn't be worrying about this, so I'm I'm um, I'm just going to suppress it. And he says, when we do this, it often breaks out and causes other problems. Suppression yes. suppression is the worst way to try to control negativity. Second, he says the mind and imagination amplifies emotional fears. The higher must solve the problems of the lower. The mind for the astral and the soul for the mind. So if you have fears that bother your emotional body, say cause and there's, there's fears of the mind and fears that affect your feelings. The fears that affect your feelings, they have to be uh, uh, solved by the mind. Now the fears that affect the mind, which is where you're thinking of, maybe you're thinking of what's going to happen in the future and stuff like that, where your mind is going wild, producing fears, that needs to be controlled by the soul. So the higher, the we must seek the higher to control the fears of the lower. He says, do not crush out fear, force it out by the dynamic power of substitution. So it doesn't go into a lot of detail about this, but uh, substitution. So if you're fearing one thing, substitute that thought with something else. Substitution is different from suppression. Suppression is you just pretend like the fear doesn't exist. But substitution, you're not pretending. You just replace the fearful thought with a positive thought. And that, uh, that, is, uh, that will help. So the third way of overcoming fears is uh, concerning a feared event or panic is a direct method of relaxation, concentration, stillness, and flushing the entire personality with pure white light. He says you, you quiet the emotions and visualize a triangle of your soul and the master at the top. Okay, so you have uh, the triangle of you, your soul, and a master. You, for the master, you can visualize Christ or DK or Kuthumi or somebody like that, uh, or just a generic master. And visualize this triangle and a, a, a pure white light coming through the triangle. It says, call down a stream of pure white light and pouring it through your lower vehicles to cleanse away all that hinders. Flood yourself with love and light. 
Okay, so this is a method that you can use in your uh, your visualization. Visualize the, the white light coming from above, uh, and you're a part of a triangle. The master is part, and your soul is a part, and this white light is coming down from above in circulation, flushing out all the negativity in your uh, emotions and your mind. He says, for fear is connected with the work, because many disciples, he says, are fearful about not being worthy or not being good enough or whatever. He says, raise your vibration, link up with your soul the best you can, and analyze the situation. See the end and the beginning, and realize that things will work out for the best. So see the end and the beginning, and then it's in between the end and the beginning is where the fears and worries come in. But when we see the end, that it will be positive, and the beginning where you just started, uh, come to the realization that the middle parts will just take care of themselves. And this will help to alleviate the disciples' fears. You have to endure, endure to the end. Endure to the end, that's a good point. Good point. The disciple doing important work may have fears concerning attacks from the dark forces. If extra help is needed, you can link up with the large lodge of the masters, the Christ, or various higher lives. You then pour through the linking chain through all the vehicles, visualize a stream of violet light. This method is only for use when the need is dire and the necessi necessity is great. The reason for caution lies in the etheric vehicle, which responds most violently to the color of violet. So, linking up with the masters themselves, he says, the disciple just does this in times of great need. For one thing, is they have a lot on their agenda. And so they're not going to stop what they're doing and pay attention to you unless what you're doing is important. So this method is just to be used for the disciple at certain specific times when extra help is needed. Okay, um, fears fall in two categories for the worker, fear of the future, what the future holds, and secondly, doubt as to the outcome of any effort. With most people, it's a combination of two. Okay, any more comments on fears? Anybody have anything they want to cover on that before we close it out? We're just about reaching the end of our time. When I was doing coaching in L.A., uh, people were stressed out over one thing or another. <clears throat> and I was writing this book on immortality. I, I was explaining the number one cause of death is stress. Is, is what? Stress. Oh, stress. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Physical, emotional, mental stress. And the number one cause of stress w is the feeling that you're alone. You you're going it alone, that you don't have any support. And so I said, well, you know what? We have, in this group, we have, uh, we all have time. We all have good intentions. We all have abilities. We all have strength, all positive. Uh, there really isn't any reason why any of us in this group should have any stress or fear that we can't overcome by, by just communicating with each other and yeah. uh, you know we, we're we're like cylinders we've got to you know, keep ourselves moving in a, in a positive way and make ourselves available to each other i know i haven't spent a lot of time with like joshua or ken or any one-on-one you know, -on -one, but i know that if we have a struggle or something that we're confronting that each of us is available i know I have a lot. I'm the Adam. Yeah. yeah, I know. Um, I know quite a few people uh, get on the chat line on uh, connected to the group, and 
and chat with each other and link up and so that's good so if that you're very helpful that uh that's one great part about this group is uh anytime you feel uh, like you need to make a connection there's somebody willing to talk to you and uh we got a really good group of people i'm proud of this group they're uh uh Uh, groups like this, uh, I don't know uh, if I could find one anywhere else uh, that uh, are um, searching the way that you guys are. So I'm I'm really glad to have you on board. Okay, um, our time's about up. Any other comments or questions before we sign off? I have something uh, regarding all the face. Uh, what is it? Uh, YouTube's that I watch every night is. Uh, the whole uh, ancient alien gods and things like that. In yeah, there's a lot of those things on it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you've already you've already tapped into that in your writing. So you, we've got our father from Venus and uh, Jehovah from Saturn. And it's like then there's all these other uh, Baal and Osiris. You know, who are, who are these guys? I mean, if you if you started doing some, uh, you know, expand it on the gods of the Bible kind of thing and take it into a, a book length. Make yeah, I probably ought to do that. Make some. You, you. I swear, uh, you you would be so big a hit on on uh, <clears throat> YouTube uh, that you know people would ref other people on these topics would be referring to you and, and showing bits of your clips and things too. As it, you'd get yeah, out. I was thinking doing, maybe you know, maybe just doing one on reincarnation. The Bible would probably be uh, might be pretty good to do on YouTube also. Yeah, you know, and that's, you know, uh, uh, pick pick some of these, some of these things is like, I, you know, I know they have, uh, uh, they've already got cookies on me and they know what kind of things I like to watch. But even still, if you just go in there for, on anybody's computer and uh, go to YouTube, it's like, these are very popular topics. They get a lot yeah. of coverage. And, and, and the people that write about them, like this uh, Linda Moulton Howell, She's all big on the aliens things. So oh, yeah. Everybody else jumping in. It's like, and they all they all quote each other, or they'll say, and and this person said this, and then then they'll they'll show a clip, of a piece of that person's a uh, uh, video, and it's like, literally, it'll get you out to many more people. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. People have been suggesting that past few weeks. Although I'm going to give it some serious thought. Good idea, Rick. I mean, that's what Joseph Smith did. He was talking about this ancient civilization that nobody else knows anybody, anything about. He wrote a whole book about it, supposedly found some way to decode uh, yeah. plates and all that. It's like, man, that's some, that's a pretty heavy uh, sci-fi right there. It's, you know? Yeah, right. That was that's quite the like that story. Stuff. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I have to use my imagination, like he says, use our imagination and come up with some stuff. Yeah, right Good so. suggestion there, Rick. Anything else before we tune out here? Well, I wanted to compliment you, Joe. You know, a lot of other groups, the leader kind of sets himself up as a light and a know-it-all and, you know, the final authority. And, you know, what I like about you is you don't do that. You just... Uh, Pretty humble servant, and uh, all I'm around. just your ordinary old Joe. So <laughs> good old, good old Joe. Yeah, but but um, look what look at the effect you have on on hundreds of people. You know, yeah. I've read your book and materials, and, and uh, well, you know, I think you, you're Curtis. a pretty bright light. Well, thank you, Curtis. That was really uh, nice of you. And uh, I'd like to mention uh, maybe. Uh, if everybody would take this into consideration is that, uh, you know, we're here on Zoom so that we can see each other and transfer our energies and feel each other. And for the guys who uh, have cameras and keep their cameras off, I think it's kind of a disservice to the rest of us for what we're involved in with the Zoom. Uh, you know, well, some, of them, some of them don't maybe have, they have reason. Part of the trouble, yeah, so. Yeah. I, I understand that, but I'm saying for the ones who do, uh, I think it's kind of important that uh, we see each other on, on these Sunday meetings. Uh, yeah, the more, a little we, bit more closeness. Yeah, that always helps. Okay. Um, 
Well, we appreciate everybody showing up, and uh, we, I appreciate your energy. And when we have a meditation together, it's always a, a always feel an uplift from it, and I'm sure you guys do too. So we will look forward to seeing you next Sunday, all being well. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Gotcha. Have a powerful okay. week. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Life, life, love. Live, live long <laughs> and prosper. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Let me see here. End meeting.